I use a lot of funny symbols in my videos when I talk about pronunciation. But what do these symbols actually mean? Well, I'm going to tell you about that today and why it's something that you absolutely have to understand if you want to get excellent at the pronunciation of any language. I'm Luke and this is Polymathy. This video is brought to you by LingoPie, which gives you access to content that can really push your language learning to the next level, especially when it comes to good, authentic pronunciation. And this is a great way to apply the skills that I'm going to teach you about in this video. LingoPie combines multiple proven learning language techniques into a single platform, using authentic native language content like TV and movies and making it perfectly accessible to anyone. Something I really like is this new mashup feature. You see the script on the right here with the native language, underneath the subtitles in English with keywords that are highlighted. You can pause the video at any time, then you can go back, you can listen to the word pronounced. Che cos'è internet? Io finisco il lavoro e torno. You can even record your own voice trying to pronounce the line that you hear in the show, and then LingoPi will tell you if you are doing it right or not. Pronunciation is a hugely important aspect to language learning. It's often ignored but we need to have good pronunciation for two reasons. One is that we need to understand the people that we listen to. And number two, people need to understand us. LingoPie helps make flashcards for you based on the vocabulary that you want to learn in the content that you're watching. And also, like you see here, makes a quiz for you based on the stuff that you've already watched. It's very impressive. I hope you'll use my link in the description for your free trial for LingoPie today. This is a cross-section of the human mouth, or indeed of the human vocal tract. So the vocal tract can be open, and when it is open and there are no obstructions of any kind, that is how vowels are made. That's the definition of a vowel. Consonants are some kind of obstruction to the vocal tract, and vowels have no obstruction. But they do have kinds of articulation, and let's talk about those now. The three main features of vowels are height, backness and roundness. Height is the openness of the mouth, really of the jaw. How high the tongue and the jaw are, how close they are, or relatively how open they are. And that's sort of a vertical kind of axis that's called height or openness or closeness. The next feature falls on the horizontal axis, and it is called frontness or backness, normally backness, how far forward or how far back the articulation of the vowel sound occurs in the mouth. And the third feature is called roundness, and this refers to how round the mouth is. For example, in certain vowels like u and o, the lips are rounded, but in other vowels like e, e, a, those vowels are unrounded. Linguists often call this the vowel space, and it's represented by this trapezoidal diagram. The back axis is for back vowels, and the front axis is for front vowels. I'm going to talk about those in much more detail today. The front axis is normally angled like this in order to represent the fact that when the jaw and the tongue lower, they come a little bit uh, down and to the right from the perspective of this diagram. With this abstraction of the vowel space, we can accurately map vowels. And we need this so that we can actually have clear discussions because there are vowels that are similar between languages but not always the same. So in order to meaningfully learn the pronunciation of any language accurately, we really need to understand how this vowel chart works. The International Phonetic Alphabet is a myriad of symbols for both consonants and vowels, and today we're just going to talk about the most important vowel sounds that we need to know that go onto this chart. Let's start with the vowel E. This IPA symbol represents a high, front, unrounded vowel. And the order there is also important. That's normally how we describe them, that it's high and it's front and that it's unrounded. So that's the height, the backness, and the roundness. U goes here. U is a high, back, rounded vowel. So unlike E, it is rounded. U. Well, this raises the question, if E is a high front unrounded vowel, does there exist a high front rounded vowel? Yes. And that is the sound E. So E is exactly the same as E. That is, the height of the tongue and the jaw are the same. E. And then what we do, instead of allowing the lips to be essentially relaxed or more uh, open from side to side, we round the lips. 
as if it were like an oo sound. But it's just the lips. Everything inside the mouth stays the same. And if you've never made an u sound before, it isn't easy because, well, if any of these vowel sounds don't occur naturally uh, to, uh, to any of us, it's just not part of our native phonology. So we have to learn it and practice that muscle memory. So try with me now. We have the nice e sound, which has our jaw and our tongue are high, so it's a high vowel. It's front, e, and then keep that tongue in that same position and just slowly round the lips, e, 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 e. This vowel occurs in languages like French and German, as well as ancient Greek. And in French, it's like la lune, the moon, as well as German zeus, which is sweet. This vowel sound occurs in lots of ancient Greek words, for example, in the word su, which is you. By convention, rounded versions of vowels are placed to the right on this chart. So the unrounded version, i, on the left of the axis, and the rounded version, u, on the right of the front axis there. Well, wait a minute. Let's see the back axis. We have the u. U is a high back rounded vowel. Does there exist a high back unrounded vowel? Yes, there does. And instead of oo, we unround the lips and we get oo. <laughs> Not easy for me to make. This is sometimes how the u vowel of Japanese is described, like in kuki, which means air. So those are some high or close vowels, sometimes called closed or close, usually both used as an adjective. So those are high vowels. But if we open up the jaw all the way, or we put the tongue uh, down as far as, uh, as we can go in uh, our own languages, then we get um, vowel sounds that range from ah uh, to ah, uh, so ah, uh, and we'll talk more about those later. But between the high vowels and the low vowels, otherwise called the close, and the open vowels are the mid vowels. So in this mid-range, we have a couple of uh, horizontal lines here. And the first one marks close mid. The close mid front unrounded vowel is e. And this is a vowel that occurs in Italian and French, for example. And it could be heard in the Italian word perché, why. The next line down is called open mid. An open mid front unrounded vowel is E, and this also occurs in Italian. It occurs in English most of the time, too. So, for example, the Italian word caffè, caffè, coffee. The next vowel we need to talk about is A, as in Italian, amare. And this vowel is neither front nor back. It lies on the central axis. It is an open, central, unrounded vowel, A. But like I said, the majority of English speakers don't have this vowel. In fact, if you've never really looked into this in much depth before and you're a native English speaker, you may have identified this sound, which occurs in Italian and Latin and ancient Greek, with the native English vowel a, as in father. So if you're studying an ancient language, like say Latin, and you're a native English speaker, and you've just been using this back vowel a instead of the central vowel Ah, I know they might sound similar to you, but I promise they sound completely different to people who are native speakers of languages like Italian and Spanish. So listen to a lot of them to hear what the actual ancient Latin vowel sounds like. Now, in addition to ah, as in father, a lot of English speakers have a rounded version of ah. So let's round the lips with that one. And we go from Ah, as in father, father, to ah, 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 so as in caught. Now, I cleaned that up a little bit because I actually have a diphthong for that vowel. And this is true of a lot of the phonemic vowels for native English speakers, depending on where they come from. I say caught. And it's not exactly ah consistently, but ah, ah. So it, if I were to exaggerate that, I would get something even more northeastern urban, which would be, say, typical of a New York traditional accent, like instead of coffee, it would be coffee, coffee. And we hear that diphthong more strongly pronounced. Caught, coffee, 
Um, I adore this diphthong. And it's interesting because I have it too, which I realized just making this video. I do have not simply aw, but aw a little bit. And uh, I don't know, I find it really um, a charming sound when it's more pronounced, like in the traditional New York accent. And another note on how the way that we write things isn't always exactly uh, the way they're pronounced, even when we use the incredibly reliable International Phonetic Alphabet, IPA. For example, think of the English word me. So me, when I pronounce it in my native um, North American pronunciation of English, I say e, and it's not a diphthong. But in a lot of British accents, it is a diphthong. So it's not me, but me. It's for me. So it still ends in the same e sound, but it starts with i, which you see here on the chart. And so i, which can be found in hits, pin, etc. This vowel is a near close or near high and a near front unrounded vowel. And because it doesn't fall exactly on the front axis, sometimes it's called a lax vowel, as opposed to the ones that are on the front axis, which are sometimes thought of as tense vowels in English. And it has a rounded version. So let's say e, 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 u, 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 u. As for the two back vowels, uh, which for me are caught and caught, quite a few English speakers have what's called the caught caught merger where the rounded version, which is aw, uh, has been unrounded and has merged with a. Ah. So people who have this merger pronounce caught and cot the same. And usually they sound more like uh, the way I say caught. Just today, I heard someone make a pun and they have this merger. And that, I know that because it wasn't funny to me. Uh, they were talking about, oh, the uh, sports get their names from funny places. And for example, hockey is obviously named after a hawk, the bird. And to me, hawk and hawk sound completely different. But to people who have the, the caught caught merger, uh, they sound the same. So it would be something like uh, hawk and caught and hockey. And this is also probably a good time to talk about the difference between phonemic and phonetic transcriptions. Usually, when we discuss languages, we talk about their phonemes, but sometimes we have to talk in more detail about their true phonetic realization. For example, um, I pronounce caught, I have the aw vowel, but the true phonetic realization is a little bit of a diphthong, aw. Just as in British English, e exists, except for most speakers, its true phonetic realization is really e. This is also one way to use the slashes versus the brackets when transcribing IPA, when transcribing words into the International Phonetic Alphabet. Usually, using slashes, which is a broad transcription, means that the person is usually just marking the phonemes. For example, if I were to write amare, like this. Okay, well, it shows that there's the R sound. But when R is singular, it's not trilled in Italian when it's intervocalic like this. It's in fact just an alveolar tap. Amare. It's not amare. Amare would be incorrect for Italian, but amare is. So the phonemic transcription with the slashes gives us the basic identity of the phonemes, whereas brackets tend to be a little bit more careful about the true phonetic realization. But it's not a black and white thing. In fact, if I wanted to be much more correct with my IPA for amare, I would use the vowel letter that I had talked about before, the open, central, unrounded vowel, which has those two dots on top of it. And yet, even though this is one of the most common vowels in, say, Italian and Latin and Spanish and many other languages, it's usually not transcribed this way in IPA. Almost all the time, it's written like this, but as we can see, a plain letter A is actually a front axis vowel, and it doesn't sound the same. So if the open back unrounded vowel is A, and if the open central unrounded vowel is A, then this open front unrounded vowel must be A. Now to an American ear, this vowel sounds pretty much the same as the Italian vowel, like uh, parlare or amare, but it's just a little bit more 
fronted. And notice there's not a lot of space on this open lower axis here, so it can get pretty tight. So the uh, the sound of Italian, like amare, ah, 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 a little bit closer to ah, but it's not quite ah, is it? And that's because ah, especially in North American English, it's represented by this symbol, ah. However, a lot of British people using the exact same vowel as in, say, trap, in, uh, in my American accent, trap, in British English, it's a little bit lower sounding, more like trap, uh, depending on the speaker. Of course, there are plenty of British speakers who actually do have the exact same vowel, and there are Americans who can have even that more British type vowel. But you can see, just for learning different accents in English, for example, learning about dialects and uh, ways to do impressions, if you get good documentation, which goes into the detailed phonetic and very accurate, very narrow transcription, then you have this theoretical framework now which can guide you in the right direction. And you'll know when the person who's doing the transcribing is cutting corners. Well, they're not really cutting corners. They're just using simplified conventions, like writing the normal letter R in amare instead of the alveolar tap, which is the actual sound that it makes, even though phonemically it doesn't matter. But another thing that I hope you come away with today is to see that this is a theoretical framework, but vowel space is a space that's very difficult to pin down. These look very precise, and the terminology is very clear and precise. But even when you have people who speak the exact same accent and dialect of the same language, they may have slight variations. They may have an ah uh, vowel which wanders up or down. So in the English speakers, this vowel can be in many different places. And uh, the E could be different places. Depending on the speaker, all of these vowels could be in a slightly different place than how they are produced in a theoretical simplified vowel space diagram. Now what I'd like to do is empower you to be able to learn any and all of these vowels instantly. And the way we do that is by searching for IPA vowel chart and we get this. The first link for me is this one here. And this is fantastic. Wikipedia is really wonderful and really useful for learning about phonology in a lot of detail. So this IPA vowel chart with audio is fantastic because we see a lot of the characters that we were studying today and a whole lot more that we haven't talked about yet. And what's really cool is you can actually click on these and hear the audio played for you. There are a few more vowels here that I didn't talk about yet. For example, we have the open mid back vowel. And uh, what is that? Well, uh, we have the rounded version, which is o, like Italian, buono. And we also have the closed mid version, which is o, like sole, sole. And uh, they also have an unrounded version. I mean, you see there's rounded and unrounded versions of almost everything on this chart. So if this is bono, a, and we unround it, a, 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 then we get the sound in, in the word for however in English, which is but or cut, a, a, a. And uh, so that, that's that sound. Now, what's interesting, too, is when I say words like uh, a, like saw, my aw isn't quite here, and it's frankly not quite here either. It's somewhere in between, and that's another uh, aspect. And we'll look at this in, uh, in a few minutes. We'll see how when we actually look at a language, the true mapping of the vowels isn't necessarily going to fit neatly into these corners. It's going to be maybe slightly displaced, and it'll be different for different regional accents and dialects. And interestingly, too, like I mentioned, I don't have the caught cot merger. Now... What that means is that these two vowels, which may be idealized, it would be ah and aw. Ah. My ah vowel is a little bit more forward than that. It's approaching that central axis, ah. While the other vowel, like when I say caught, ah, or if I stabilize the main monophthongal part of it, which is aw, ah, aw, ah, versus ah, aw, ah. ah. So they're a little bit separated. They're not quite in the corner, either of them. So this is where when you have two vowels that are somewhat similar, right in the same part of the vowel space, they tend to find ways to push apart from each other.
This explains a lot of phonetic changes that happen in languages, which end up becoming phonemic changes later on. Like with the caught cot merger, for example, people who have the merger, well, their vowel is really not necessarily like my ah, uh, like when I say hot uh, or lot or something, because it's mine is approaching that central ah. It's not quite the same. I know because I have to work to make sure I don't use my native ah vowel sound in say Italian or Spanish. While people who do have the merger, it will be a little bit further back, this merged vowel. I also wanted to note that the audio that you can hear is done by just one person who's outstanding at this, but it's important to keep in mind that it's just one representation of these vowels, and they can have slight variations. Think of them as more fuzzy regional areas than precise points. So if this is o, and this is o, uh, and if this is e, and this is a, well, what's this? This is the mid. This is the uh, the mid front unrounded vowel. The mid front unrounded vowel. Uh, we usually uh, like to call them true mid vowels because they're not close uh, mid or open, but they're true mid or simply mid. And uh, phonemically, this is the vowel for e in Italian, no, in Italian, in Spanish as well as modern Greek. And there are plenty of other languages that have it too, but it's important because Italian and French, for example, have e and a and o and o, and because they have these, they don't have these in the middle as phonemes, even though phonetically they can occur. We'll talk about that in a second. So phonemically, in the mind of, say, an Italian, there exists e and a, but e, which is right in between, the Italian ear may, depending on where that occurs in the word, the Italian ear may interpret that as the closed mid or the open mid version. And that's very interesting. So when we talk about, for example, the pronunciation of classical Latin, uh, the actual change of the quality of long vowels, like the long letter E, uh, which would be um, uh, probably open mid during the early, rep uh, the, uh, early part of the first century in the late Republic. So a closing to more true mid, a, and then eventually to um, a close mid, a, somewhere towards the end of the classical period. Or more likely, there was a whole lot of variety going on. The point, though, is that phonemically, phonemically with the difference, uh, the difference between long and short vowels in Latin, when it comes to the mid vowels, both the letter e and the letter o, it, the true mid is probably the best and simplest explanation because then we get a and o, and, for example, in that uh, wonderful paper by Andrea Calabrese, I talked about the Calabrese pronunciation of Latin. That is just to say that he, he showed that, well, there, there he is. And he simplified by saying, okay, just the open mid. And the open mid is probably a close approximation. But true mid is also equally valid. So, essentially, the vowel sounds of, say, Spanish or modern Greek. But, interestingly, uh, and, hope, and we will later, and we will later go and look at how these uh, vowel charts actually work and say Spanish and in modern Greek and see that even though phonemically they have this true mid vowel for e and o, uh, they actually may have realizations that are more open or more closed, also depending on the environment of what's in the word, depending on the dialect. Uh, so that's the idea. Phonemically, Italian and French have a difference between e and e and o and o, but Spanish does not. Modern Greek does not. The closed mid, a, has a rounded version. So if we start with a, and then we round to u, so e, u, u, u. So that's this sound, u. Also, um, in English, depending on where the person's from, a lot of English speakers don't have an e sound. Uh, we have, say, the word they. Uh, and they, this is often given in textbooks, just explain the sound if it's A in Italian or maybe if it's in Latin, for example. And it's completely wrong uh, because they is a diphthong. It starts with A, but it ends with I. They, they, they. And that is not the same as A, which is a pure vowel sound. And it sounds similar enough phonemically for a native English speaker, but it's not at all a good approximation if we're actually dealing with that language. This is why I encourage um, people who are interested in reciting, uh, learning the pronunciation, speaking in Latin, for example, to, uh, to really study this, because then you can uh, understand that a lot of assumptions that are given to you often by textbooks, which well, I just don't, don't necessarily know better themselves, they approximate things with, say, oh, it's like they. 
So the sound of, say, e in perché is like ve, or the sound of a and namare is like father. Well, no, that's wrong. <laughs> it is, uh, it's very, uh, those are just the closest things we might have, uh, depending on our dialect of English. Um, but uh, the phonology is just so different, and it ends up uh, coloring the vowel space to be, well, distinctly English-sounding and not, say, Italian-sounding or Greek-sounding or Spanish-y sounding or whatever language it is that we're, we're talking about. So, um, e, u, e, e, like sœur in French. Um, and here, if it's true mid, so e, 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 e. But this little thingy looks like a T. It could be also upside down. Uh, what is is essentially an arrow, and the, the, the bottom part of the T is the bottom part of the arrow, pointing down, because it's this close, this close mid E, but it's down, one step. But it's not this far down, it's just uh, down one, <laughs> uh, to some degree. Uh, and specifically, it's the, it's the mid one. You could also technically take this one and put a, uh, a, a upside down T, which would be an up arrow underneath the letter, and say, oh, it's up one step, and it would be the same thing. But this is conventionally how it's normally represented. Um, there are a lot of, in fact, IPA characters which represent uh, more than one sound. If you, actually, this is uh, cool and fun to do. And here we see that the exact same sound has uh, two symbols. But it depends. Maybe there are important differences. If someone's talking about dialects where, well, it's almost an A, but it's lower. And it's almost an A, but it's raised. A little bit so there might be some case where the person talking about it is using these symbols a little bit differently and saying oh no there is a difference between them um, so it's fun this is a lot of fun and the true mid a the rounded version a u a u so this is u u so like that anyway um, oh right in the middle here this is a really important vowel this is the schwa and uh, phonetically, the schwa sound occurs in pretty much all human speech. It's just the sound of uh, the mouth um, as relaxed as possible. Uh, neither rounded nor uh, unrounded, uh, not really anything. Not, uh, you know, it's completely central, completely mid, and, uh, and nothing. So, uh, uh, schwa, schwa sound. This vowel here, which is the uh of book or look. In fact, when I say it normally, it's book look, there's a slight diphthongization where it's not simply uh, but uh, uh, look. Uh, and that's, uh, that's true of a lot of people who book, who, uh, who have this uh, sound in their um, native language, well, their native English language, which is uh, what we have. So that's what that sound is. And uh, one more to talk about is the sound, which is uh. So it is central, you know, kind of like ah, uh, uh, but it's totally high. So it's uh, uh. And this is the sound given for Russian, for example, u, uh, like sum. Um, and here, the rounded version, u, uh, uh, may be the sound of the sonus medius, uh, the middle sound for words like optimus, optimus. This sound occurs in Latin and is an explanation why Latin changes from writing this as an u to writing it as an e, from a letter u to a letter i. Uh, and they, in fact, the ancient grammarians talk about the sound being something between uh, u and e, being neither, somewhere in between. So uh, probably the sonus medius, which occurs in a few words, is represented uh, best by this IPA character. Now that we've gotten this introduction to the vowel space and the IPA symbols that are being represented here, let's try it out a little bit and look up Spanish phonology. Spanish phonology. Okay, and these Wikipedia pages are fantastic because often there's audio which goes along with them. Let's go right to the vowels. And here is the vowel space. Now look at that. Now before we were talking about the A ah of uh, Spanish and Italian, A. Ah, it's uh, not like A ah and father, but it's more, it's central. It's A. Ah. But here it's being depicted as being not quite central. It's a little bit towards the back, according to these researchers. Uh, and also note that the the U also isn't quite as far back. It's a little bit forward as well. Isn't that neat? So, uh, but we do have a true mid E and uh, O here, which is is very interesting that uh, that exists. The E is is reasonably uh, high up in the corner. So this one looks pretty much iconic for uh, for E. Um, so that's really fascinating. This is what the five vowel sounds look like, and a lot of languages have this basic five vowel system. Now let's go to LingoPie for some authentic content in Spanish. ¿Sabéis si antes de morir mi hermano dijo algo o firmó algún documento sobre quién heredaría su corona? No, Alteza. 
Now, if you're Italian, I'd be very interested to know how you interpret the vowel in alteza. Is that more like altezza, which is the Italian equivalent, and that has a closed e, altezza, or does it sound like alteza, like does it sound more like e or e to you? The Italian ear will hear either the closed e or the open e, and this true mid vowel, alteza, it's not either. So it's very interesting to speak with Italians and to hear that. Let's listen for some more of these true mid vowels. Darise de vuestras palabras. No tengáis duda de ello. Hay tiempo que perder. Chacón, preparadlo todo. Perdón, Alteza. And there we hear todo, all, and that is a true mid o, and also perdón. So we have uh, perdón, which has true e and o, as well as todo. So these are all true mid vowels. So if you're Italian, I'd be fascinated to know what you hear, because Italians will hear these as either e or e or o or o. If I had to guess, I would assume that if Italians hear something like perdon, they might hear it as more open because Italian perdone is closed. That's a close o, whereas the o of perdon is slightly more open. It's not a fully open o, but they might interpret it as an open vowel because they would expect a closed one in that position. So we have um, here in Italian, this would be perdone altezza, so there would be uh, o and e respectively, but here it's perdon alteza, and those sound more open, I think, to Italians. Now let's take a look at a vowel system which is reasonably similar to Spanish, and that'll be here, Greek phonology. So we have, of course, ancient koine uh, phonology. Koine is a part of ancient Greek. It's separated here because it shows the developments between classical and modern Greek. But we're going to go to modern Greek phonology go right to the vowels. And here we see this vowel space is a little bit different, isn't it? So we see that uh, very interestingly, here, let me zoom in here. So interestingly, the uh, the E, which was right up in the corner in Spanish, according to those researchers, right? Uh, but here it's it's rather uh, lower. It's, it's more, you could, um, it's not nearly as close, not nearly as high. And the E is also lower. That's interesting. The Ah isn't necessarily down here. It's a little bit more closed, the mouse. So instead of ah, like in parlare, ah, ah, it's a little bit more ah. It's not a schwa, it's not a, uh, but it's a little bit towards that. The o is essentially in the, um, the uh, right, right here in this um, horizontal axis is about the same as it was for Spanish, but it's a little bit more centralized, as is the u. Isn't that cool? So even languages that have essentially the same fundamental five-vowel phonology may have a phonetic uh, expression of those phonemes that's a little bit different. How about we check out French phonology? French phonology is really cool, uh, especially in the vowels, because there are also nasal vowels. And this chart gives us a sense of how these work. We see there's e, but note here that the and the u as given here is ra rather it's a uh, it's not in the same position, is it? It's it's lower. We have the a and e like Italian, but notice that these researchers put these um, with a, a variation, not exactly where we expect. So there's some centralization, then there's the nasal versions of some of these vowels, like there's uh, there's an a uh, vowel, but there's also the an, the nasal vowel. So nasal vowels, they have this wavy line over it, and they're the same quality. Everything is, is the same, except that air is allowed to pass through the nasal cavity when uh, making these vowel sounds. So there's um, e, and then there's this a, uh, which is rather, rather a bit lower. So isn't that neat? Let's listen to some French from Lingopie. Le pont est fermé. So in this phrase, we hear both open e, e, fermé. And we hear the e in fermé, as opposed to the e of is. So there we go, the close and open version of those two mid-vowels. How about some German phonology? I like German. German is super toll. So uh, here is German, and wow, it's, it's interesting how much more complex some of these vowel systems can be with respect to um, uh, something like, say, Spanish or uh, Spanish or Greek, which uh, there, there's some interesting variations in there. Uh, so German has an, uh, this E, and the E of German, though, is a little bit more central in position, according to these researchers. They're not right next to each other, so... Uh, uh, e instead of being u, it's not quite as front. Maybe it's more u u u u u. So like zeus instead of zeus, zeus would be up here, but zeus 
a bit farther back. Isn't that interesting? And um, there are the ah. Uh, these, of course, are long. These two triangles mean length of the vowel. So there's the, the long. They're long and short variants. German does have phonemic vowel length, uh, which is important in uh, certain certain words and certain positions. Now let's go to LingoPi for some German content. Es war nur eine Frage der Zeit. What is the vowel sound at the end of Frage? If you guessed a schwa, you're right. And speaking of other German, Germanic languages, let's look at the vowel systems of English. Oh my goodness, there's a lot going on here because there are, of course, a lot of English speakers around the world geographically separated, so quite a few variations. And uh, rather than seeing the vowel space marked out, this is a little bit more... Um, diagrammatic, uh, showing us uh, the, the variations in vowels. For example, received pronunciation, which is the, uh, the uh, quote-unquote standard pronunciation of British and general American, which is essentially how I speak. Uh, we see, for example, that uh, received pronunciation has a distinct E phonemic long. Uh, it's phonemically long, whereas in general American, it isn't phonemically long. I find that very interesting. And uh, we also see that there is a nice uh, long all sound in uh, British, like uh, that's a good, good example. Um, maybe caught, like caught, which I say is caught. My, mine is, uh, is in a different position. And uh, anyway, so just these little variations are fascinating. So if you're interested in learning accents or dialects or being able to um, produce some of these things in practice, even if you're just speaking a variety of English, then you can utilize. You can utilize this system. And then, of course, there's Australian. Australian is wonderful and really beautiful, really cool. And this is one diagram of how Australian vowel space can be understood. And since we talked about it so much, how about a little bit of Italian phonology, something that I'm really fascinated by. Now, uh, here is the vowel space for Italian. Again, a lot simpler than German or English uh, or even French, but, but more complicated than Spanish or modern Greek. So we have the uh, E which is here, and e, e, a, o, o, u. So it's interesting, because we come to these languages with a sense that, ah, okay, it's like this, or it's like that, and often, I like to use Italian a lot for my bass, because these are pretty stable for standard Italian speakers, but there's a lot of writing in uh, native Italian speakers. A lot of Italians do have this, the distinction between e and e, um, there are a few who don't, but almost all of them do. Um, but they're not necessarily in the same word. So their standard Italian will, you know, says perché, but there are some Italians who say perché. They totally reverse close and open vowels um, for the for the mid vowels, which is very interesting. So this is, of course, an expression of just by these researchers uh, covering one um, particular uh, uh, speaking group. In general, though, uh, a lot of standard Italian will follow this pretty closely. So that's why I like to kind of think of this as well as Spanish as my kind of um, my anchor points uh, for getting a good sense of vowel space when nearly uh, the extremes are reached. But we see that they're they're centralized a little bit. Isn't that interesting? So they're not completely at the far ends, which leads to a difference. Um, so when because uh, this symbol here is essentially representative, but this symbol here really kind of covers uh, a fuzzy space so that we can have a sound like like caught in uh, a British English or oh, but to say that that sound sounds like well no is different because I, I just know that it doesn't sound the same to my ear so there's some uh, variation here in tenseness and laxness there's also um, variations in oral posture and various other things that can't easily be described on an IPA chart um, so it's interesting so be cautious um, and attentive when certain symbols are used, especially when this is used to describe the English sound and say food, uh, you might see F-U-D um, to represent the phonetic spelling, the international phonetic alphabet spelling of the word food. But ooh, in my speech, which is true of almost all English speakers, there is a diphthong there. It's not ooh, but ooh. Because if I said food, it would sound, I don't know, maybe a little bit like old-fashioned, classy, I don't know, Downton Abbey kind of sound, something uh, kind of odd there. Um, uh, but it wouldn't be how most Americans speak, and I would also dare say how most English speakers uh, say this. They don't say food as a pure U vowel. There are some, there are plenty, but they aren't um, necessarily as numerous, depending on what dialect of English you want to go for. And also note that the A here isn't right on the close midline. It's a little bit higher. 
Here are the vowels in the vowel space that I use most in my own research. And it's slightly simplified from the other vowel chart we were seeing. Feel free to take a screenshot and use it if you think it's useful. But as we've seen, there's a lot going on with vowels, but this is definitely the place to begin. I hope you found this interesting and informative. And if you like this, and if you want to see more, or if you have some interesting impressions about how you've dealt with some of these problems, whether you do know IPA, or you uh, have only used it a little bit, or if you've been confused about this before, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Thanks so much. Wale piccola uagola blandola, qui nunc in arbore uh, facis aliquid quod nescio. <laughs>